Well, thank you, Terry, for that most generous introduction. I don't know where you got the pipeline to my students, but uh, uh, it shows evidence of thorough research. <laughs> Ten days before his assassination, Abraham Lincoln took responsibility for something that had occurred four years before, on the eve of his first inauguration. In hopes of arresting the secession movement, Lincoln told a friend, he passed words to his friends in Congress on the last night of the session in early March 1861 that they should pass the resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution prohibiting Congress from any interference with the institution of slavery in the slaveholding states. On the face of it, the source for this alleged recollection seems wildly improbable. Duff Green, the aging Jacksonian turned Calhounite, had a political pedigree almost antithetical to Lincoln's. Green's enthusiasm for territorial expansion also might have distanced him from Lincoln. And the Civil War placed them on opposite sides. The Kentucky-born Green was a Georgia railroad builder when the Union disintegrated. But the two had become friends when they roomed together in the late 1840s at the Washington boarding house run by Mrs. Ann Sprigg and Green was connected by marriage to Lincoln. In 1849, Lincoln had asked Green to help him win an appointive office from Zachary Taylor. A decade later, in December 1860, Green's tie to Lincoln remained well enough known to insiders that James Buchanan dispatched him to Springfield to try to persuade Lincoln to support the Crittenden Compromise. Green and Lincoln next met in Richmond on April 5, 1865, when Lincoln visited the just-surrendered Confederate capital. Green, who happened to be there too, sought the interview, and the evidence suggests that Lincoln welcomed the opportunity to talk with a Southern elder and an old friend about ending the war and reconstructing the Union. Green recalled that Lincoln received him with great kindness. During this conversation, Lincoln reminded Green that in 1861, Lincoln had supported the constitutional amendment forbidding interference with slavery and that he had done his best to avert war. Green's version of his talk with Lincoln garbled some points of detail and must be regarded with caution, but it's likely authentic. The Senate certainly did pass a would-be 13th Amendment at the very last moment, just hours before Lincoln's inauguration, and the House had done likewise a few days earlier. This first 13th Amendment of 1861, never enacted, uh, but passing both houses of Congress, uh, read as follows. No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to the Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. Uh, persons held to labor or service, it's the same sort of circumlocution as in the Constitution of 1787. And Lincoln certainly did endorse this amendment in his first inaugural address. Standing at the east front of the Capitol on March 4, 1861, Lincoln pointedly denied that here the Republican Party intended to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. He had neither the lawful right nor the inclination to do so. Lincoln then noted that Congress had just passed a constitutional amendment to address the matter. Because he considered such a provision to now be implied constitutional law, he had no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. In short, the man who would come to be known as the great emancipator first came to power, having just okayed a prospective 13th Amendment designed to prevent, to prevent any attack on slavery in the states where it already existed. Keep in mind that this 13th Amendment was the polar opposite of the one that was eventually adopted in 1865, four years and one more later. In my brief presentation today, I wish to examine the seeming anomaly of this first 13th Amendment. In so doing, I'll preview the book that I'm now writing, which explores the striking paradox, why leading Republicans, including Lincoln, who plainly didn't like slavery, we're ready to add a pro-slavery amendment to the Constitution. I'll begin today by exploring the ways that other historians 
have tried to make sense of the would-be 13th Amendment of 1861. I'll then turn to explain why the amendment has ceased to be a part of American historical memory. Historians today tend to be pro-emancipation and pro-Lincoln. Uh, I am too, and I suspect that nearly everybody in the room is also, unless there are a few uh, uh, Thomas D. Lorenzo enthusiasts uh, floating around uh, somewhere in the back. There occasionally are in my classes at school, and uh, I teach uh, outside the old Confederate states, so I think D. Lorenzo may have more of an audience than uh, we might wish. Anyway, um, back to the historians. They find it challenging to explain Lincoln's position on the would-be 13th Amendment. In some instances, they simply ignore it. This is what Harold Holzer chose to do in Lincoln President-Elect, an otherwise minute and admiring recent account of Lincoln's life from the presidential election through to the inauguration. Holzer briefly mentioned the amendment, but he didn't touch the evidence that Lincoln played a concealed role in securing its passage, and he pointedly overlooked Lincoln's announced readiness in his inaugural address to accept it. Holzer, the self-appointed custodian of the Lincoln legacy, who I listened to on NPR as I drove home from work one day recently, works on the frontier between history and hero worship. <laughs> Other historians try to minimize the significance of the amendment. Adam Goodhart got wide notice last year for a book entitled 1861, The Civil War Awakening, which assesses northern attitudes between the autumn months of 1860 and the early summer of 1861. His core idea is that white northerners, having long blinded themselves to the obvious, awoke to take on the task at hand. They finally grasped that emancipation had to happen. Thus, it was a war against slavery even before it began. Goodhart, clearly, had difficulty explaining Lincoln's professed readiness to accept the amendment. He surmised that this part of the inaugural address was composed in an apparent fit of absent-mindedness. <laughs> For good reason, Goodhart judged the first inaugural is not quoted much today. Several historians who have participated in this forum in years past have written about the amendment. Doris Kearns Goodwin's 2005 book, team of rivals attracted a great many readers, doubtless including many of us here in this room. She brought her formidable biographical skills to bear on Lincoln, William H. Seward, and Salmon P. Chase, and she wrote with authority about their complex interactions. Her subtitle, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln, plainly indicates her overall view. Goodwin suggests that Lincoln would have preferred not to mention the amendment, but she points out correctly that he substantially rewrote his inaugural address at Seward's behest. Readers are left with the impression that Lincoln was bending over backwards to accommodate his soon-to-be Secretary of State and that this episode may not have exhibited the new president's political genius. Russell McClintock, a few years ago, got your prize for the best dissertation. It was converted into his fine recent book, Lincoln and the Decision for War, which tersely summarizes the divergent perspective of the two key principles. Seward knew that Southern Unionism was precarious. Even though Upper South Unionists denied that the Republican threat to slavery was severe or imminent enough to justify immediate secession, they demanded Republican concessions. But Lincoln knew that any reversal of Republican policy would destroy the party and he thought that repeated assurances that the North had neither authority nor inclination to interfere with slavery ought to have been enough to satisfy the South. In McClintock's eyes, the amendment was a relatively harmless gesture, unlikely to arrest the drift toward war. It did not touch Republican opposition to slavery expansion. Two of my distinguished colleagues who share the podium here today have also wrestled with the would-be 13th Amendment. Michael Burlingame, in his two-volume magnum opus, Abraham Lincoln, A Life, uh, the green monster as he referred to it, uh, which all of you should read. Uh, it's a good read. Um, you're bound to find something there that you didn't know about before because, frankly, Michael knows more about Abraham Lincoln than anybody else alive today. And we're all in his debt for this uh, huge uh, project. Um, 
In uh, The Green Monster, Burlingame survived, uh, surmised that, that Lincoln, slip of the tongue, um, <laughs> surmised that Lincoln supported the amendment as a sop to the Sewardites and to public opinion in the Upper South and the border states. Lincoln took the position he did, knowing that the amendment had little chance of being adopted by three quarters of the states. Burlingame also floated the possibility that Lincoln only inadvertently accepted the 13th Amendment and that Seward somehow tricked him into commending it in his inaugural address. Here, Burlingame relied on the authority of John A. Bingham, an interesting person, a leading radical Republican House member from Ohio. Now, Lincoln certainly might have wanted Bingham to think something along these lines. Um, the future author of the 14th Amendment, that is Bingham, uh, hated the idea of countenancing slavery in the Constitution. But Bingham's 1886 recollection, a full quarter century after the event, cannot easily be squared with the available evidence from February and March 1861. Lincoln never was haphazard in his use of words, and Burlingame himself correctly surmises that Lincoln covertly aided the moderate Republicans who were attempting to get the amendment passed. I turn to Eric Foner's prize-winning study, The Fiery Trial, which has been so nicely summarized by the man himself uh, earlier today. Um, and I'm going to be reading even more about it next week when my students hand in their written assessments of it. Um, so uh, um, The Fiery Trial is clearly uh, the book du jour. Um, Foner has wisely cautioned that we should not see Lincoln's career as a straight line leading to emancipation. Foner recognized that the constitutional amendment was more than just a minor concession and that it angered many hardline Republicans. But he judged that the South correctly understood that Lincoln was unwilling to retreat from the central issue of the controversy, his insistence that slavery was wrong and not, not be, ought not be allowed to expand. Accordingly, many Southerners did not view Lincoln's inaugural address as conciliatory. And Foner noted that an even more thoroughgoing concession would not have brought back the seven seceded states. The Crittenden Compromise would have strengthened the hands of unionists in the Upper South, but would have not done anything to resolve the crisis. Most of these so-called unionists, this is still Foner, were prepared to secede rather than see force used against the Confederacy, even if the latter struck the first blow. In effect... Foner's Lincoln was posturing when he commended the amendment. He knew it would have no effect, but by accepting it, he put the blame for the coming war where it belonged. The principal difficulty with Foner's formulation is his confidence that things were bound to turn out exactly as they did. From the perspective of early March 1861, however, the future was inscrutable. Considerable evidence suggests that Lincoln hoped to preserve the peace and hoped his reassurances might find an audience among reasonable Southerners. Historians need to keep in mind that history is understood backwards, as if viewed through a rearview mirror, even though it must be lived forwards. Hindsight strips away history's cliffhanging excitement and its ability to surprise. By knowing what happened, we impose on ourselves a kind of tunnel vision, in which the course of history is predetermined, and we assume that the more astute actors at the time could have been expected to understand what was coming. Some evidence suggests that Lincoln did understand long before March 4 that the outrageous action of the Deep South states had set in motion a dilemma that was bound to lead to an armed collision. But other evidence points in the opposite direction. I would side with Michael Burlingame, who wrote that immediately after the inauguration, Lincoln, and I'm quoting him here, could breathe a sigh of relief and look forward to a peaceable solution to the secession crisis. Lincoln had reason to think that he had gone the extra mile to extend an olive branch to white Southerners, even at the risk of alienating more radical Republicans. He had insisted that he would enforce the Fugitive Slave Act, and he had endorsed the constitutional amendment. In so doing, he had demonstrated unmistakably that he had no agenda overt or covert to menace slavery in the states. One additional circumstance also suggests that the new president could hardly have been expecting to fight secessionists in the foreseeable future. 
he had just appointed Simon Cameron as Secretary of War. Uh, if you get into the Lincoln Papers, you find there's more correspondence in January and February uh, about the tussle between Salmon Chase and Simon Cameron than any other issue whatsoever. Uh, they both wanted to be Secretary of the Treasury. The booby prize, mind you, was Secretary of War. Um, and Cameron becomes Secretary of War, a person widely judged to be either incompetent or corrupt or both. In short, the Duff Green interview rings true to me. Lincoln hoped to preserve the peace rather than fight a war when he first took office. I turn now from the historians to the matter of historical memory. There are three principal reasons why the House and Senate's last-minute approval of the would-be 13th Amendment and Lincoln's explicit acceptance of it has disappeared from sight. First and foremost, it was overtaken by events. The war that it was designed to avert started six weeks later. During the course of that war, the ground rules that had remained in place through March 1861 were swept completely away. By going to war, secessionists spurred a growing determination in the free states to strike at slavery, the apparent taproot of the rebellion. A war originally waged to restore the old union as it was became a war to create a new union in which slavery had no place. The actual 13th Amendment, enacted in 1865, four years and one more later, specified exactly the opposite of the original version. But I think you need to understand the 13th Amendment of 1861 to realize how absolutely the war changed everything and made it possible to adopt the 13th Amendment of 1865. And parenthetically, uh, I think it was... Uh, was it Eric was saying, or was it you, Michael, that the, uh, uh, you know, the all-time list of bad decisions, uh, the secessionists, uh, I do think, uh, win the prize. Uh, uh, the only way that slavery could have been uprooted quickly was by their going to war and creating a war uh, that would destroy slavery. The second reason why the original 13th Amendment has been forgotten is that it runs counter to the prevailing idea that Lincoln and the Republican Party refused to compromise with the disaffected South. To be sure, almost all Republicans opposed concessions on the territorial issue, and majorities of Republicans in both houses of Congress also opposed the amendment. But the amendment never could have been passed without Republican leadership and significant Republican support. Its chief architects, Thomas Corwin, William H. Seward, and Charles Francis Adams, were eager to hold the Upper South in the Union and to stem the secession tide. In the end, they persuaded Lincoln to accept their handiwork. Even outspoken radical Republicans who voted against the amendment, notably, notably Thaddeus Stevens and Owen Lovejoy, disclaimed any right to touch slavery in the states. They objected instead to rewriting the Constitution in the face of secessionist threats. The focus for my new book will be the bruising fight to secure two-thirds majorities for the amendment in both the House and the Senate. Seward, then a New York senator, made the initial overture, but the heaviest li lifting took place in the House. The veteran Whig-turned-Republican Tom Corwin of Ohio headed the House Committee of 33, charged with trying to defuse the crisis. He had two key allies on the committee, Charles Francis Adams of Massachusetts, the son and grandson of presidents, and Henry Winter Davis, the charismatic Maryland know-nothing, already headed toward becoming a Republican, uh, but still at that moment a point person uh, for Southern Unionists. At the last minute, Seward and Thurlow Weed provided some quiet inducements to win over just enough Republicans to get the two-thirds House majority. It went down in the initial vote on February 27. Um, Seward and Weed put shoulder to the wheel overnight, and voila, uh, it passes by the slimmest of margins the next day, uh, Thursday, February 28th. The amendment then went to the Senate. A combination of Republicans and secession-leaning Southern Democrats tried to bury it there, but it improbably survived thanks to the bulldog leadership of none other than Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln's longtime nemesis, uh, but on this issue, his ally. Douglas kept the Senate in session all night before the inauguration, finally getting a vote at 4.30 a.m. on Inauguration Day, Monday, March 4. 
There is impressive evidence that Lincoln passed word that he wanted the amendment to pass, just as Duff Green subsequently reported. Republicans hated the word compromise, but key Republican leaders instead offered a significant symbolic concession. It required outreach across party and sectional lines. The third, and I think in some ways the ultimate reason why the would-be 13th Amendment has been obscured, is that it tells modern Americans something about our national history that we do not want to know. Today, most Americans look at slavery with dismay, as we should, and as I suspect everybody in this room, or I hope everybody in this room does. Um, But this often undercuts our ability to see the United States as it was. We celebrate slave runaways and relish more information about the Underground Railroad. We persuade ourselves incorrectly that large numbers of slaves escaped from bondage and that many northern whites reached out to black fugitives. We forget Lincoln's lament to his Kentucky friend, Joshua Speed. This was already quoted earlier by Eric Foner. I confess, I hate to see the poor creatures hunted down and caught and carried back to their stripes and unrewarded toils, but I bite my lip and keep quiet. We find it difficult to accept that slavery once was normal, taken for granted, and very much a given. We also tend to overlook the ugly reality that African Americans living in the free states before the Civil War were shamefully excluded from economic or educational opportunities and from public life. Racial stigmas, the perverted stepchild of slavery, blighted the entire nation. And Abraham Lincoln, who pledged not to interfere with slavery, doesn't fit with our image of American history. 21st century American sensibilities, combined with a widespread tendency to exalt Lincoln, make it difficult for us to conceptualize the situation in 1860 and 1861. It makes no sense to us that professedly anti-slavery Republicans, including Lincoln, could vouch that they had neither the power nor the intention of touching slavery in the states where it already existed. We assume that they must have been kidding but we assume wrongly. To be sure, Lincoln and his friends did not like slavery. They hoped that eventually it would disappear, but they had no blueprint to get from here to there. They counted on white Southern slaveholders to realize at some point in the future that free labor would create a more prosperous and productive society than slave labor. The very last thing that Lincoln and the Republican Party wanted or expected in 1860 and 1861, early early 1861, was a protracted war to revolutionize Southern society. We now honor Lincoln as the great emancipator, but during the troubled months following his election as president, he had no such aspiration and his attention was totally absorbed by other matters. As it became plain that he faced the gravest political crisis ever to confront a new president, he could not have spared a moment to think about the many indignities and hardships suffered by American slaves or about the long-run future of slavery. We cling to an image of the Civil War as some kind of cathartic epic in which the boys in gray and the boys in blue bravely jousted with each other. Their sacrifices, or so we tend to see it, ultimately re-knit the national fabric. Alas, The wish to have a history we can feel good about gets in the way of understanding what actually happened. Americans have grown far too comfortable with the Civil War, Edward Ayers has written. We give it a moral purpose it assumed only gradually and against the will of many who fought for the Union. The war began with a catastrophic breakdown of governance. It brought wholesale violence and misery on a scale that never could have been imagined in advance and that still staggers the imagination today. We find it difficult to accept that history is too messy to conform to a logical script. Because the war ultimately restored the Union and abolished slavery, we think it must have been entered into and conducted by far-sighted leaders who had clear objectives in mind so that its outcome somehow was predetermined or foreordained. This version of history has little connection to the wrenching uncertainties and terrible tragedies through which people lived and died during the 1860s. And it gives short shrift to the assessment of the person best entitled to an opinion on the matter. Again, we have mentioned this before, but in the famous Hodges letter of April 1864, I claim not to have controlled events, Lincoln famously remarked, 
but confess plainly that events have controlled me. Thank you. I welcome your questions. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. you're fine. Um, the, third, the proposed amendment stated that it would be irrevocable. Um, Lincoln um, somewhat clumsily put that word irrevocable in the inaugural address uh, because um, the original version of the amendment that had been concocted by Corwin and the Committee of 33 back in January uh, was written in such a way uh, that every state in the union would have had to agree to change it. Uh, but um, that was judged, I think, unlikely to get the requisite uh, number of Republican votes. And so the version that's actually voted on uh, does not have this irrevocability in it. Uh, it was exactly the same, say, as the uh, uh, amendment uh, uh, you know, the 18th Amendment uh, on spiritus liquors or whatever that was abolished by the 21st. Uh, but Lincoln uh, perhaps was still uh, thinking of the earlier version when he uh, got that uh, misleading word irrevocable into his inaugural address. Uh, what Congress had actually done, uh, now any amendment to the Constitution is a very high threshold. Uh, only once uh, in the, uh, you know, 200 plus years have we ever... Uh, uh, turned around and removed a constitutional amendment, uh, but uh, the actual irrevocability aspect that had been part of the January version was not part of the one passed in March. But what, what was the actual text of it? Did it not say Congress shall never? Well, I'll just, I'll just um, uh, read it uh, back to you again. No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. But I think those words imply that Lincoln's reading of it is a fair reading. If the amendment is saying that no further amendment shall, in a sense, undercut what this amendment is saying, it is a revocability. Now, I would okay. argue as a lawyer, I, okay, I, don't know, I, hear you. I, hear you. I don't know any theory in jurisprudence by which either a statute or an amendment can be made permanently irrevocable. And I guess because of that, I tend toward Mr. Burlingame's school of thought that perhaps it was a, thought, a sop, that how could a lawyer as shrewd as Lincoln have truly felt that a statute or amendment can be made permanent and irrevocable? And, the, and perhaps then the reason that he's endorsing it is that he realizes it, it's, it's, it's a fool's errand. It, it cannot be lawful to bind future Congresses and future nations to this particular amendment now. Okay, two quick points. Um, even though I have uh, indicated my disagreement, a case can certainly be made uh, that this was sort of a, uh, a pointless gesture, a fool's, a fool's errand, uh, that Lincoln surely understood that this thing was never going to go through uh, that it was just a bit of window dressing. Um, and, and the other point here, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm up against a lawyer, uh, so I, <laughs> uh, I, I think that, um, that what needs to be kept in mind, though, uh, is that the, the January version of this amendment uh, was a striking example of uh, Calhoun's minority veto, uh, the wording... Uh, that was uh, before the House uh, throughout most of the two months in January and February was written such that any one state could prevent any change with the amendment, and that disappeared from the version that I just read to you. Uh, so to that extent, there was a rewrite uh, to make it uh, a little less, um, uh, as the way Lincoln called it, um, you know, unamendable. Um, and I think it was done deliberately because... Uh, Corwin and Seward knew how to count noses, and they needed a few more Republicans to go for this thing in order to get it over the top. Uh, and this was a made, way to make it a little more palatable. I guess we should go to the other side. Rest assured, uh, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, but there was another shrewd lawyer involved in this that you mentioned, and that's William H. Seward. Indeed. Who was... Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, originally considered too radical 
to be the presidential nominee of the Republican Party. Indeed. So why is he a handmaiden to this um, amendment, which would seem to go against his uh, true beliefs that um, slavery was um, an abomination on the nation and that uh, he, yet he was going to politically perpetuate it in the states where it existed? Well, you've just touched one of the fascinating issues about the era. Uh, Seward certainly is passed over in part because he's thought of uh, as more of a radical uh, and a kind of worrisome one on North-South issues, and Lincoln was uh, considered more likely to carry the key swing states of Ohio and, I'm sorry, of Illinois, Indiana, and Pennsylvania. Um, But once the election is held... Uh, Lincoln is more hardline, and Seward uh, is busily trying to arrange some kind of a, a settlement that can appease uh, the Unionists in the Upper South. I mean, Seward's whole project during the secession winter is to try to find some formula to keep uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee on board, uh, whereas uh, Lincoln, for the most part, uh, is giving Seward a hard time uh, and issuing stern vetoes from Springfield. Uh, about Seward's various schemes. Uh, But once Lincoln reached Washington on Saturday, February 23rd, um, I think that uh, the moderates uh, got to him and persuaded him that uh, eh, this wouldn't be so bad. It wasn't consistent. It was was perfectly consistent with the Republican platform of 1860, uh, which specifically said we have no plan to touch slavery in the states. Um, Corwin and Lincoln were old friends going way back. Uh, Well, they may not have been old friends, but they were both old Whigs. Back in the 1840s, Corwin had been a high flyer, whereas uh, Lincoln is a first-term congressman. But, you know, they share the same pedigree. Um, And uh, Lincoln was amenable, uh, I think, in hopes uh, that just maybe that there could somehow be a sober second thought uh, after he took power. I am confident he took power not expecting to be fighting a war in the immediate future. Uh, And I rest my evidence once again on the appointment of Simon Cameron. And, of course, once you have a war, what happens to Simon Cameron uh, as the war heats up? we got to get this guy way out of town. What's the furthest place out of town we can get him (laughs) off to Russia? (laughs) (laughs) uh, Over here. I've always wondered about this issue of manifest destiny coming into the Crittenden Compromise and the thirteenth and this so, uh, would be would be Thirteenth Amendment. Do you want to comment on that issue? Whether the line would include Cuba and Northern Mexico as possibilities at some point in the future? Well, you can approach this in a couple of ways. Uh, there clearly had been uh, a steady kind of drumfire of interest and enthusiasm for acquiring Cuba. Um, a whole range of people. Uh, especially, of course, Democrats, including Douglas and Buchanan, have thought this would be a great idea. Um, So clearly there's something to this idea of Caribbean expansion, Um, but um, um, I'm not as persuaded as some of my colleagues that there was any imminent danger of it once Lincoln had been elected president. Uh, He clearly thought it was a bad idea. And so uh, I'm more inclined than some of my colleagues to see the whole territorial issue uh, as a certain kind of uh, sort of symbolic theater rather than involving something real and tangible. Um, uh, I know that there are Southerners who dreamed of this Caribbean empire, uh, but I don't think it was um, any kind of uh, uh, threat to the level that uh, some of the books that you will read argue that you know, uh, Lincoln and the Republicans had to do what they did in shooting down the Crittenden Compromise because otherwise uh, we'd have been on the high road to a slave empire. I think those are Lincoln's words. Um, um, no, it was that the Republican Party, the glue that held it together, was this opposition uh, to expansion into the territories. Um, and uh, in order to uh, hold together that coalition that had successfully won the presidency, uh, they, need to hold, they needed to hold firm here. They had the awful example 20 years before uh, of the Tyler administration, uh, a president without a party. Uh, uh, I know that that was uh, 
something that Lincoln was passionate to avoid. He was a good party guy, Michael was pointing out. Uh, uh, you know, he's not going to uh, turn on his party, um, uh, even though there clearly were pressures to do so. Uh, Crittenden is a very unlikely architect of a Caribbean slave empire. He's a long-time Whig. He, he hates this sort of stuff. Over here. Hi. Um, to expand the story a little bit on this first 13th Amendment, yes. did any state act affirmatively, affirmatively or negatively on it? Yeah, a couple of states uh, ratified it. Um, and I was just learning uh, from a, a young scholar who introduced himself to me, uh, uh, Phil Magnus, wherever you are, that the, uh, there he is, that the, uh, uh, the would-be restored government of Virginia out in Wheeling in 1861 uh, decided to jump on board too. So uh, I think it's two states, um, uh, kind of forget which two. The whole thing's overtaken by events, but we can add the restored state government of Virginia, which Lincoln regards as something real uh, for the duration of the war. Over here. Wasn't it Illinois? That was yeah, the I think one? Illinois, which also, you know, is a bit of evidence and uh, help me out. What was the other state? <laughs> Maryland. That's right. Uh, here I am at the podium forgetting the states <laughs> I should know. Uh. Well, I have a question more on process. The um, the amendment to the Constitution requires supermajorities super in both houses and then a supermajority of states' Correct. legislatures. It does not require presidential action. No, and it doesn't. Lincoln did sign it. And I used to always think that was a great testament to the fact that he was really committed to this and he wanted his signature. But then I discovered that the other 13th Amendment was signed by Buchanan. And it also turns out that uh, I think the Senate got its nose a little out of joint after the signature by Lincoln, and they actually passed a resolution making sure that in the future it would never happen. I believe that's the only time a president has signed an amendment, those two, 13th. And I wonder if, you're, if, if in your book you've gotten into that any further. Well, the book is still in process, and I'm picking up good ideas as I uh, listen to the questions that are coming my way. <laughs> but you're quite right that the president has no role directly uh, in amending the Constitution. It's the two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the state, uh, or this alternative of a national convention, and I don't think I want to go there. Um, but um, Lincoln certainly did um, um, uh, send out notice to the states uh, that this thing had been uh, done by Congress, and he signed his name to it, and um, Bill Harris, the eminent historian uh, from North Carolina, was just reminding me that he'd found in the papers of uh, Governor Ellis of North Carolina, a copy uh, of this notice that the 13th Amendment has passed Congress with a signature both of Lincoln and Seward. Uh, and Harris told the archivists in North Carolina, hey, this is a valuable document. Don't just leave it here. Uh, uh, treasure it. And uh, sure enough, they did. Uh, but yes, it was very unusual. But what's also unusual here is that Lincoln was uh, a no doubt about a champion of both the 13th Amendments. Um, Eric Foner was speaking earlier today about the way that uh, Lincoln, no, I guess I was speaking to him privately, um, when, the, when the real 13th Amendment, the one that we all know and cherish, uh, passed the Senate in 1864, uh, Lincoln was originally kind of standoffish uh, and seemingly almost uninterested in it, but he warms up to it as the uh, presidential election approaches um, and uh, comes out for it four square in his last message to Congress in December 64, and he's in there pitching um, in uh, January 65 uh, with Seward and Weed out in front, uh, dangling all kinds of goodies to uh, um, uh, lame ducks in, in the House uh, to get the 13th Amendment through the House in late January 1865. Uh, I teach in New Jersey, and I regale my students with uh, you know little tidbits about how uh, people like, uh, uh, you know, obscure New Jersey congressmen uh, who had been vociferous and complaining about all the ills of the Lincoln administration, the terrible infringement with civil liberties, uh, the way they had upset the racial apple cart, so on and so forth. Uh, some of these guys mysteriously came down sick uh, and missed the vote uh, when the uh, real 13th Amendment slipped through uh, in late January 65. So Lincoln... Uh, curiously, uh, was strongly in favor of both of these 13th Amendments. 
Over here. Right. Oh, first, a note for the lawyer. There is a section of the Constitution which may not be amended, and that's the one that requires equal representation of the states for all times. Uh, that's right. We, we, you, we must have two senators from Wyoming, the same as two from California. But my question to you is, can you talk a little bit about the actual composition of the House and the Senate in February of 61? Uh, of course, it's the old Congress, but weren't there a lot of Southerners leaving the oh. Congress at that time, which would then have uh, increased greatly the, uh, the, the, the northern votes, and therefore they should have been able yes. to do anything. Yes, this is, this is correct. The, um, uh, by the time the action on the amendment takes place, the last week of February and the first few days of March, the seven seceded states and all their reps uh, have taken off long before. Most of that was happening in January. Um, and so... Um, somewhat to their surprise, the Republicans had majorities in both houses of Congress uh, because of secession, which they would not otherwise have had. So Republicans were in a position to begin to kind of push their agenda, uh, which they did do, for example, uh, by pushing through an increase in the tariff. That had been part of the uh, uh, Republican platform in 1860. Um, so nothing could have happened in Congress unless a significant number of Republicans went for it. And even though majorities of Republicans opposed it, I mean, one Republican after another in the House is getting up making a speech about how this is a terrible thing and we shouldn't be amending the Constitution. But when the day was done, uh, the power brokers, uh, Corwin especially, uh, and given tremendous cover by Charles Francis Adams. I mean, what better recruit could, could Corwin get? Charles Francis Adams is the son of John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is a, uh, a kind of uh, no longer alive but, but uh, honored legend to the anti-slavery cause. Charles Francis Adams himself had been the vice presidential candidate of the Free Soil Party in 1848. And getting that whole Adams pedigree to go for this thing uh, helped, um, you might say, coat the pill. Um, and then um, it's evidence, I think, of Corwin's skills uh, and Seward. Um, Seward's role here is so hidden, but it's there. I mean, Seward's the one who wrote the words. Uh, the language of the amendment that Corwin reverted to are actually Seward's words. Um, and Lincoln comes around and says, okay, um, get the thing through Congress, and I'll mention it in my inaugural address. I guess one last question. That's good. I've got two thoughts I'd like to uh, lay out for your consideration. First of all, on the territorial issue, you recall that after the Mexican War, Jefferson Davis introduced a measure in the Senate to provide for two regiments to hold the Mexican territory until such time as we decided what to do with it. And the second is that the major, the uh, second part of that point is that the major proponent of the acquisition of Cuba was Augustus Belmont, who came to the United States on behalf of the Rothschild interest, mm -hmm. and one, and he split with Buchanan on that uh, over because Buchanan wouldn't grant him his his view uh, because by buying Cuba, the United States would bail out the Spanish monarch and also the Rothschilds. That's one point. The other the other side of the point is on this Thirteenth Amendment. Uh, there was a basic difference between Lincoln and Seward that I'd like you to think or maybe perhaps give some comments on. Seward's basic quarrel with the South was the overthrow of the slave power, which had ruled the United States for 60 years from, Jeff from Jefferson through Buchanan, whereas Lincoln had a, had a more humanitarian concept. Lincoln, Seward never really came to the abolition of slavery the way Lincoln did, it seems to me, and, and Lincoln had a compassion for as you wind down slavery in a basically racist nation, how are those people going to be brought to a position where they could survive and, and take care of themselves and, and be part participants in the society? Now, I'd like you to comment on those two points. I think you gave me three points. Um, <laughs> let, let, me, let me see if I can work backwards. Um, um, we had a very eloquent and persuasive case this morning from Eric Foner uh, that Lincoln had this this kind of enlarging view of the uh, way in which African Americans would have a future uh, in the United States. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, this is, uh, for good reason, uh, one of the most important books that has been published in this field for many years. 
uh, I find large parts of it very persuasive. Um, uh, but as relates to Seward, uh, Seward grew up in a world where there was much more overtly uh, abolition and ideologically anti-slavery influence than Lincoln grew up in. Um, uh, Lincoln is coming out of Kentucky into southern Indiana and into central Illinois. Uh, Seward spends his whole uh, post-college life up in the burned-over district of New York. Uh, Francis Seward is an out-and-out -out abolitionist, and many of the rank-and-file people in upstate New York are that way, too. Um, and I don't think you can put all that much daylight between uh, Seward's position uh, on matters of race and slavery and Lincoln's position. Um, I'm impressed by the evidence that Seward and Lincoln uh, hit it off very well, uh, even though initially, of course, uh, Seward was bitterly resentful of the fact that uh, Lincoln had got the nomination. I think David Donald has correctly included a chapter of Seward, on Seward there uh, in his book about Lincoln's men or, or, or Lincoln's friends. Uh, back to the peace treaty, um, by the time the war ends, this is 1848, uh, James K. Polk would have liked all of Mexico, but that's not what he got from Nicholas Trist. Uh, and Polk was absolutely enraged by what he got, uh, but in the end, he found he had to swallow it. He didn't get all Mexico, uh, but he got a pretty decent chunk of it. Um, and as far as Cuba, um, I guess I would just come back to what I said before, that um, with the Republican Party uh, stronger um, by this point than it had been before, and with Lincoln as president, there was not going to be an annexation of Cuba, uh, and the uh, uh, or, or of any other part uh, of Central America. Uh, uh, in this respect, uh, there was a uh, uh, a kind of understandable caution on the part of Lincoln and Seward and many other former Whigs uh, about the downside of territorial expansion. Uh, and in particular, of course, Cuba is one of the remaining outposts in the West Western Hemisphere where slavery is still practiced. Uh, the United States was, was um, uh, not going to acquire uh, uh, Cuba in the foreseeable future uh, so long as Lincoln was president and so long as the Republican Party uh, had a substantial uh, uh, presence in Congress. I think I've no, used no, my no. time. Dan, Dan uh, we have about five minutes left. Oh, I, okay. I wonder, wonder if you could summarize for the audience your findings about the Diary of a Public Man. Oh, well, um, Michael has very kindly tossed me a little softball here. Um, I, a few years ago, I wrote a book uh, about a mysterious document called The Diary of a Public Man. Uh, this is something that appeared in a kind of bombshell fashion in 1879 in a widely read magazine called the North American Review. And it caused a huge amount of buzz and speculation because it appeared to be written by a longtime Washington insider who had somehow gotten privy to what was being said behind closed doors at the very highest levels between late December 1860 and mid-March 1861. There's accounts there of conversations with Lincoln, uh, with Seward, uh, with Stephen A. Douglas, uh, and, and it reads like the guy had an audio recorder and he's uh, given us the straight scoop. And um, immediately when it was first published in 1879, speculation began, well, gee, uh, who could have written this thing? The North American Review published it, uh, withholding the identity of the author, uh, but assuring its readers that this was indeed a diary. Um, and for the most part, historians for the next 70 or so years figured, gosh, this must be real, but who wrote it? Um, and it wasn't until the mid-20th century uh, that a by then rather senior scholar, his name was uh, Anderson, who had been working on this thing for several decades, uh, decided, no, it wasn't quite what it pretended to be. Uh, it was a mixture of fact and fancy, and it was done by a fellow named Sam Ward, um, a Washington insider who would later become known as the king of the lobby. Um, and that's where I first encountered this thing. Uh, we're going back about 40 years ago or so when I first got going on my book called Reluctant Confederates. Uh, this document at the time struck me as being, wow, this guy knows a great deal uh, that, you know, there's a lot of real information in this diary uh, that really stacks up. Somebody had a, uh, you know, a marvelous inside view. Who was it? 
I wasn't sure. I knew that there were questions that had been raised about the diary. I didn't regard it as a, a legitimate source that I could trust, so I totally omitted it from reluctant confederates. You'll find no mention of it there. But I did think that at some point in the future, it might be fun to work on. Um, and to make a long story short, uh, assisted initially by uh, an undergraduate student uh, and by a colleague in the statistics department at the college where I teach, uh, we got going on a project uh, called stylometry, the statistical uh, way of attempting to try to uh, track down uh, authors of mysterious documents. Um, and um, as this project began, my undergraduate uh, working on his own senior thesis uh, introduces uh, this mysterious character, at least to me, I hadn't heard of him before, William Hurlbert, uh, who was uh, quite a player back at the time. He was editor of the New York World. Uh, he was regarded as a very accomplished a uh, journalist who had a particularly facile pen. And uh, I learned that he had been the guy who wrote editorials for Henry J. Raymond's New York Times at a remarkably young age. Uh, uh, in his late 20s and early 30s, this is back before the Civil War, uh, William Hurlbert uh, is writing editorials for the New York Times. And once you get a feel for his, uh, for his rhetorical style, you'll quickly see his editorials there. This is very convenient now, of course, because the editorials for the New York Times are right there at the, uh, uh, you know, the touch of a mouse, and uh, you can just see them on your computer screen. Um, anyway, um, I quickly realized that Hurlbert probably is the guy. Uh, the statistician came up with corroboration from his uh, sort of exotic techniques. Uh, yeah, it looks like Hurlbert's the guy. And so I kept after it, uh, happily, uh, the historian who uh, did the Sam Ward identification uh, did what perhaps more historians should do. He simply left all his, his notes taken over many years to the Library of Congress. Um, they're quite a remarkable collection of primary source research. And it wasn't really till about 2005, uh, looking around in these things, they're stored up here somewhere in College Park and you have to have them ordered in advance to uh, bring them down to the manuscripts room of the Library of Congress. Only then did I see that Anderson was close to getting it right, that this could not have been a real diary. Uh, in fact, it wasn't a diary at all. It was something that Hurlbert uh, concocted from scratch, I am convinced. Um, Anderson didn't believe it possible, but you have to know more about Hurlbert uh, to see what a clever, plausible guy he was. Um, he constructed out of, out of simply his own fertile imagination a seeming diary, and most people who try to do this, uh, they stumble. You're going to make a mistake. Uh, your, your cover is going to be blown. Uh, Hurlbert got away with it for 70 years or so. Um, and it's only, uh, I would say, with my book the past couple of years, that I think we have an accurate handle on what this thing was. On the one hand, a fake, a very ingenious fake. But on the other hand, full of remarkable and accurate information about what was really going on behind closed doors because Hurlbert had excellent sources. Sam Ward lives next door to William H. Seward and uses his back of his house so that Seward, without being seen out on the front street where there were nasty reporters and people like that, can zoom around to the back of Sam Ward's house and meet with people that he wants to meet with in private. And there's, there's information that Ward clearly knew a great deal about what was going on, and Ward and Hurlbert become the best of friends. Uh, and Hurlbert and Ward are also best buddies uh, with a fellow, uh, rather forgotten today, but a big player back at the time, um, SLM Barlow, uh, a kingmaker of democratic politics, uh, somebody who wrote, uh, um, um, you know, candidly to Belmont, to Buchanan, to Judah Benjamin. Uh, so Hurlbert had the means of knowing a great deal about what had actually been said behind closed doors, but instead of doing what I might do, write a conventional history about it, oh no, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's somebody who will go out and write a fake diary that many more people are going to read than a conventional history, and he gets away with it. So read my book and find out more about it. <laughs> Thank you very much.